microphone. So if you have questions, come down the uh, middle aisle here. I'll have the microphone. And so please, please uh, come on up. Before we do that, uh, Dr. Adam Francisco, there are some people here on Saturday that did not have a chance to hear you last night. Why don't you give a, a, a few minutes of just some general thoughts uh, regarding Islam and Christianity and, and all that. Some people want to uh, meet you and see you and hear you. So go ahead. Islam and Christianity in a minute? Yeah, in a minute. <laughs> Well, let me just summarize uh, in a couple minutes what we looked at last night because the, the slight alteration of the schedule is uh, we did one section on Martin Luther and Islam. and um, It was just basically a description of Luther's approach to an interest in Islam. I, don't, I didn't mention last night, but in the wake of all that, it's interesting in Germany in the 16th, 17th, and subsequent centuries, Lutherans became leaders in, in research in Islam. The first translation of the Quran in German was done by a Lutheran chaplain or a pastor in Nuremberg who spent four years in Istanbul, traveling around Egypt and other places in the Levant. Uh, in the 18th century, when they were trying to, to um, produce a, a, another a Latin translation of the Quran that was much more accurate than previous Latin tr translations, they were seeking, a, in particular, a, Germ or a Lutheran translator of the Quran because they thought that he was, because the you know, confessional issues and you know, scholarly standards, they thought he would be a much more neutral than many of the Catholic uh, translators. It's kind of interesting history. There's, that history is yet to be written, the Lutheran engagement with Islam, apart from just the stuff Luther has. But uh, um, that's, that's the Lutheran bit. Uh, the more interesting, I think, bit, the more pertinent stuff is the challenge, in particular, the theological challenge Islam poses to, to Christianity. We all know about, and there's a movie out there called The Third Jihad, a documentary done by Zudi Jasser and um, some other very progressive Muslims that says, we all know about terrorism. You know, everybody knows about that. And you know, that the, uh, it's mostly the secular, the civil forces uh, that are responsible for contending with that. Individual Christians in particular um, there's another struggle going on in America, and that is to at least promote Islam, at least as a legitimate worldview alternative, as it's sometimes referred to. But you, you see, you've seen it for good 13 years now that slowly but surely Islam is becoming more and more mainstream. You know? uh, and why wouldn't they try to make Islam seem more mainstream in America if, if the fundamental... Uh, uh, engine that drives Islam is this idea that you're to cause the advance of Islam for the sake of Allah. Uh, so it, more and more, I think, in the future, um, and you know, Kareem and Sabir and, and uh, a host of others can tell you this, we're going to, these opportunities or these, the, the, as, as Kareem put it earlier, Muslims are here to stay. There are neighbors, there are co-workers, there are friends at Concordia University in Irvine. We've just in the last couple of years seen a almost a marked increase in students coming from places like Saudi Arabia to study at Concordia, Irvine. You wonder why on earth would they choose Concordia? Many of them just want to study, or their fathers typically want them to study somewhere in America, but they want them to come to an environment where they're not going to be surrounded by rampant secularism and all the temptations that might be on a, a public campus. They're under the impression that that stuff doesn't happen on a Christian campus, which is false. Uh, but so they come to Concordia, and um, it's really uncomfortable for me because I'm teaching a class, an Arabic language classes, and then I get these native speakers of Arabic, and half my face is paralyzed, so I can't really pronounce Arabic that well these days, and they're sitting in my classes. Uh, but it's a phenomenal opportunity. I, obviously, I'm not going to impose Christianity on them, but when we're reading texts, we read the Gospel of John or something like that. They think they're reading literature. They don't know what they're reading. But... Uh, you know, they don't know what's working underneath those words, or in, with, and under, to be really Lutheran. I, I got a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so, Muslims are here to stay. Um, there, as Kareem put it, or maybe Saber, uh, yeah, there are those out there that are a problem. You know, the, the potential, the, the, what they call them, lone wolf uh, jihadists, or whatever they're calling them these days. But they're pretty few and far between. Um, chances are the ones that are really hardcore aren't going to have anything to do with you. Um, the ones that you're going to live around or work with are 
for the most part, they call themselves Muslim, to be sure. They're normal people. Imagine that Muslims are people too. Um, and they have the same concerns we have. You know, if they got children, they want their children to go to a good school. They want to be able to put food on the table. Uh, they want to make sure that their children are, are shielded from some of the, the horrendous things out there that you see on billboards and truck stops and things like that. A lot of the same concerns when it comes to social realities that we do. With the, the real challenge between Christians and Muslims is if you get over that fear that Kareem was talking about is when you get to that conversation, that religious conversation, is being able to engage a Muslim in a not a polemical heated debate. That stuff goes nowhere. Uh, but be able to talk seriously and confidently uh, about the gospel, in particular about Jesus to Muslims. Uh, and I, I mentioned last night, one of the points I, I try to drive home is, at least in some circumstances, in particular around university-educated Muslims, you've got to be prepared uh, to make a defense for the gospel if the circumstances arise. And more and more, I find it uh, with, with the younger people, it's always a conversation about who's got the real Jesus. You know, and then it becomes an apologetic question. You know, which source is more reliable than the other? And you got, but you got to be careful. You don't want to just you know trash the Quran. Uh, Luther, in, in, in my talk on Luther, he would even suggest using the Quran if you can, just at least start a conversation with Muslims. But uh, you got to be sensitive with Muslims. I used to, when I was young and dumb. Um, I'm 40 now, so I'm old. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 15 years ago or so maybe around 15 years ago when I did stuff on Islam publicly, I, was, I regret a lot of what I did because uh, just some of the silly things I said which were not, weren't untrue, but I wasn't really paying attention to how it may have been received or didn't, wasn't aware that it's going to end up on YouTube or something like that. And it's just wise strategically. The missionaries will tell you time and time again that love always and kindness and gentleness. And 1 Peter 3.15 ends up saying, after, the, after it, it, it encourages Christians to always be prepared to make a defense, to do it with gentleness and respect. Uh, you don't have to compromise uh, your faith with a Muslim uh, when you're talking with a Muslim. Um, and just because you're not calling Muhammad some, yeah, I don't even want to say it, because it might we're on tape, but uh, well, I'll say it. I can, you, just be, you don't have to say Muhammad was a demon-possessed pedophile or something like that, even though he did marry a six-year-old. They consummated their marriage at nine years old. Uh, he did hear voices in a cave. You know, uh, there's an angel there giving him a different gospel. It makes me think of Galatians, you know, a different gospel. Even if, if it be from a, an angel of light, may it be cursed. These things may are all true, but you don't have to ex unload everything. Uh, on, on what you think about Islam when you're speaking with Muslims. It, uh, and, and also, in addition to that, it's also wise to know or important to know that most Muslims are kind of clueless about what they believe. And uh, some of them are even, or, or a lot of them are even clueless about what Christians believe. So you'll find, and I find on a number of occasions, that when I just am, am open and honest with a Muslim about what I believe and what I think about Islam, not everything, but uh, uh, they actually appreciate it. And so I've had Muslims say to me after I give a talk uh, up in Dearborn or Dearbornistan, as some call it, give a talk on Christianity, <laughs> trying to promote or argue for the historical reality of the crucifixion and the resurrection and how that makes all the difference between the two religions. Uh, but then there was a Q&A period where I was getting asked every sort of question about what do you think about abortion and things like that. And I just gave honest answers. And I had Muslims come up to me afterwards and say, you know, we've been to a lot of interfaith dialogues and things like that. We've never heard somebody, we've always heard that there are Christians that believe these sorts of things, but we've never actually heard a Christian uh, argue that Christianity is true and therefore a fall, other opposing positions are false and who is conservative ethically and socially and, and so on and so forth. And I said, well, what sort of Christians have you been hanging out with? And it's the <laughs> ones at the interfaith things, uh, you know, the, the liberal, you know, uh, priestess from the United Church of Christ or whatever, who are there as the representatives of Christianity. And so they get a false image of what Christianity is. And we tend to, I'm sorry, I'm going longer than two minutes, but uh, we tend to run from these sorts of things, interfaith dialogue and, and so on and so forth. But if, I, I, don't, I don't know whether you should go or not, but imagine if real Christians, confessing Christians came, went to these things 
and we're the representatives of Christianity. You know, rather than this sort of liberal drivel that's sort of the standard when it comes to Christian Muslim discourse. Uh, it would be remarkable. And I, I, I know I've heard uh, Kareem and Sabir, I don't know the extent of it, they engage in this stuff. And I imagine it must be a whole new, a whole different world in your context. But uh, the stuff we see over in Cal out in California, I imagine it was in New York and other places, just you know, it's basically Muslims are able to be honest and true to their beliefs. Christians basically compromise over and over again in, in many of these things. All the more reason for real solid confessing Christians to stand up and be involved in this sort of stuff as well to sort of set the, the record straight. I think that's enough. Okay, we're going to take some questions. Yeah. If you have a question, come please stand in line. Here's Ruth. She has a question. Yeah, as, as I recall, you said that uh, the Muslims believe that Adam and Eve fell, and yet they don't believe in original sin. How do they hold those two, which seem contradictory? Was she talking to me? <laughs> okay, I'm, go I'm going to read you a, uh, a verse from the Quran. It's uh, Surah 2, chapter 2, verse 34. Well, I I'm going to start from 33. This is God speaking to Adam about the fall. Muslims read the, the Genesis, but they read it differently than we do because there is no Genesis 3.15 in the Quran. And God was speaking to Adam and he said, Oh, Adam, tell them their names. When he had told them, Allah said, Did I not tell you that I know the secret of heaven and earth, and I know what ye reveal? This is God talking to Adam to name all the animals. And behold, we said to the angels, bow down to Adam, and they bowed down, not so Iblis. He refuses and was haughty, and he was of those who rejected faith. So God told all the angels to bow down to Adam, except for Satan, Iblis. We said, O oh Adam, dwell thou and thy wife in the garden and eat of the bountiful things therein, and ye will but approach not of this tree. We call the 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 yes. apple, what do you want to call it? Or ye run into harm and transgression. So you don't eat of the fruit, or you're gonna be in or you're gonna have or you're gonna have or you got going to run into harm and transgression, then did Satan, this is where the trick comes, then did Satan make them slip from the garden and got them out of the state of felicity, which is l-fitra. In Arabic we say, when you're born good, perfect. In which they had been... We said, get ye down, all ye people, with enmity between yourself on earth will be your dwelling. And you and your means of livelihood for a time. Then learned Adam from his Lord words of inspiration. And his Lord turned toward him. For he is oft returning most merciful God. And he told them to go down to the garden to earth, and if, and then wait until I bring ye the guidance from me, whosoever follows my guidance on them shall be no fear. Let me just explain this, how I understand this when I was a little child. And all the Muslim people believed this. Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were born good. We call that state of felicity. And the first error the first creature that ever committed sin wasn't man. It was Satan. So Satan is the one who had this uh, mistake, or he's the one who has sinned, who sinned before in front of all the angels. And he uh, convinced Adam and Eve to sin. 
But they turned to God, and God forgave them. And it's pretty much, he gave him a spanking on the hand, and he said, you go down now and follow my law, and whoever follows my law on the day of judgment shall be his recount. So Genesis 2.17 is not there. Remember, Scripture said, if you eat of this fruit, you shall. <laughs> Muslims do not believe that. They don't think that they are dead spiritually. They think that they are good. And a Muslim is not as consumed as a Christian to do good, to, to get right with God as he is consumed to do good works. See, a Muslim's job on earth is to serve God, not to get right with him. And especially for us, that will be getting right with God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's the righteousness that God has given us in the person. And we claim that because of our faith. So uh, I don't know if this helps your question, but the Muslim people, they believe that they are sinners, but not the way we do. But they don't believe that they are totally uh, condemned and that they're, as long as they do good works, Allah will judge them accordingly. Thank you, thank you. Uh, other questions? Since uh, so many of us here are going to now go and uh, read the Quran so we can engage our Muslim friends in, in, in dialogue, do you have a recommendation on which translation we should be reading, which is the tra English translation that most Muslims use or find authoritative? I've heard that sometimes uh, They'll, they'll denigrate and say, which translation do you have? Now, oh, that's, that's not reliable, that sort of thing. So is there one that's kind of the standard or uh, something that we should avoid? Could you talk about that? Uh, good question. Uh, this is a man uh, al-Injil Sahih. This is a new translation that was done recently by uh, uh, Wycliffe translators and Frontier. They worked together and they put this book together and this caused a split in the, the Wycliffe group. The, uh, some of you, I don't know how many of you probably know about this translation, but this translation is the worst of all translations because, and it's the, and it's the, uh, the most used because they changed the words of Jesus to Messiah. In, in the Trinity, they changed the, the, the word of God, they use Allah. Jesus, they use Messiah, the Messiah. And for the Holy Spirit, they use angel. So when you're reading the, this, by this uh, translation, this is a translation, uh, you gotta be careful because it is supposed to compromise the gospel and make it easier for the uh, Muslim uh, people to understand. I'm not talking about the Quran, I'm talking about translation of the Quran. This is, has caused problem. For the, the Quran, the easiest one that I've been using that has two uh, English and Arabic is uh, the meaning of the Holy Quran by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. This is an easy translation. I know some of you probably have tried to read the Quran or read the Quran and found it very hard to read. It is written in Arabic and like I said in those statements, not all Muslim people read Arabic and it is a hard Arabic and uh, I will see what Adam's response be. Probably he read it and uh, got some opinion. I, I think the best bet is just you can go online if you want to give away your address, free Quran, and they'll send you usually the Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation. It's King, or King James English. Um, there are newer translations. Every translation is an interpretation to some extent, and so some soften things. There's a, I think it's chapter five of the Quran. I've, for, in my old age, I'm forgetting things, but uh, 
um, where it says uh, Muslim men, after they do certain things to their wives to, to sort of punish them, the last resort to get your wife to come in line is to, to beat her. And then the translator puts in parentheses, lightly, right? <laughs> so you, you'll see these sorts of things in, in translations. Um, you just have to understand every translation is an interpretation. When Muslims say you're not reading the real Quran if you're not reading in Arabic, most of them, if they're, if they're able to recite the Arabic, they actually don't know what it means at all because it's such an archaic form of, form of Arabic. So it's usually a way to get out of the, the argument if, if that's the, 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 the objection the Muslim has, though it is legitimate that it's not really doesn't have to carry the nuance that the Arabic does. So Abdullah Yusuf Ali, there's the Oxford World Classic series. I forget the translator's name, but it's pretty good. It softens things uh, on occasion, but pretty good, and, and it's very up-to-date modern English. It's, you can get it for $10 on Amazon. Um, I just get the free one for you. Know, deplete their resources. <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, if you want a free Quran, it's right here on uh, Spring Valley. There is the Islamic Center, and they will give you hundreds of Qurans for free. So just uh, be careful how you read them. Okay, we got another question here. Uh, last night you were talking about uh, when you engage in conversation with uh, some Muslim neighbors, and we should be very careful of how we approach that, not the uh, back and forth bantering about who's right and who's wrong, but a rather uh, approaching uh, the legitimacy of Christ's death and then resurrection. Now, uh, can you clarify? I'm, I'm not sure I understood that. Uh, do they believe that Christ never actually died, but he just was swept up into heaven or something? Uh, and then he, has, he never was resurrected. Can we dig into that a little bit? Yeah, it's chapter 4, verse 157, 158 of the Quran. It, uh, it says the Jews boast that they crucified the Messiah. No, they did not crucify him, nor was he killed. It's kind of ambiguous. Um, you could understand the Arabic a number of different ways. The majority of Muslims historically and presently take it to mean that Jesus was not put on the cross, or if he was put on a cross, he didn't die on that cross. And there are a number of different theories. One says that the night right before he's, or that night on which he was going to be betrayed, when he's up in the room with his disciples, he looks around and asks, knowing what's going to happen, if any of them want to take his place. And of course, Judas raises his hand and he gets a facelift by Allah uh, and he starts to look like Jesus. Jesus sort of disappears, he ta is taken up into the heavens, and Judas is crucified in his place. Another theory that the, um, the uh, Ahmadiyya, uh, community says that Jesus was put on a cross. They even got a book called Jesus in India. Um, uh, Jesus was put on a cross, uh, but he didn't die. He swooned. It's the old swoon theory from the 1970s, I think. And so he's taken down from the cross. It looks like he's dead. Uh, the Romans apparently didn't know what they were doing. You know, they're wonderful executioners, actually. They knew exactly what they were doing, but they didn't realize he wasn't dead. They put him in a tomb. They roll the stone in front of the tomb. It must have weighed a couple tons. And then all of a sudden, Jesus revives in the tomb. He's been beaten to an inch of his life, hung on a cross for several hours, and he's able to push this several tons uh, stone out of the way. Comes out of the tomb, uh, and then starts heading eastward to India, looking for the lost tribes of Israel. Um, you can actually go up to India. I, I don't know the name of the city. I think it's up in the Kashmir somewhere. Uh, and there's actually a tomb of Jesus. I'm told, I've never been there, but I'm told that the locals know that there's no body in that tomb. There's no corpse in that tomb. Um, but they love having it there because it brings, into money, it brings in a whole lot of money for you know, tourists and, from tourism and things like that. Um, so you got all these different theories, but the, the traditional view is that Jesus doesn't even get put on a cross. He's simply taken up into heaven. He's still living, uh, unlike Muhammad, who they certainly believe died. He's still living. Up in the heavens, he's awaiting his final return when Jabril or Gabriel blows his trumpet on the last day, where he will help the Islamic Messiah, the Mahdi, um, hunt down Jews, crush crucifixes, get rid of all the, the swine or pigs on earth, uh, and then uh, judge uh, things, and then basically usher in an era of the global Islamic caliphate. 
lots of different views of it. He wasn't crucified, nor was he killed, is, is the, the normal view. Um, I, I like it that they have that because, it, not, I don't like that, but, uh, but that they are so insistent on it because it make, it's like I said last night, it means you can have a conversation that's not theological necessarily, it's mostly historical. And for me, it just means there, there's not all the emotions wrapped up in theology and, and you know, this sort of back and forth. You can just talk about, well, how do you, why do you think that he wasn't crucified, especially when we got lots of good evidence that he was crucified. And we can get a conversation going on evidence and, and history and things like that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be your theology stinks and then them responding, no, yours stinks, and just back and forth polemicizing. Um, yeah, so that's, that's basically it. He's still living. Uh, didn't die on a cross, and, and for us, this basically undercuts Christianity. If he's not dead, he didn't rise from the dead. Uh, Christianity is false. Uh, there's an old South African Muslim polemicist, uh, Amadidat, who wrote a number of works on this sort of number of polemical tracts on this theme. And he made the point to Muslims that uh, they need to emphasize that Jesus wasn't crucified and use whatever resources, contemporary resources, they could get their hands on to show it. Because he says, if there is no crucifixion, there is no Christianity. Um, so the, they know what the centrality of these historical events and how they're linked to the veracity of Christianity. And that's usually where the polemicists, those who engage in this sort of stuff, uh, that's where, usually where they'll attack. So I'm seeing that more and more on university campuses from UCLA, even on Concordia's campus amongst the Muslim students there. Uh, they love to talk about and debate this sort of thing, and they love quoting all the, the critics out there, Bart Ehrman and Lane Pagels, and they've got whole paragraphs memorized of Bart Ehrman proving, and they, they think, that the Bible's terribly corrupt. You can't trust a thing it says. You don't know which, ones, which passages are legitimate and which passages are later innovations added to the text. So, you got Yeah, I was going to. I'm just going to read you a verse from the Quran that talks about the, uh, the crucifixion. They said in boast, this is Allah speaking to the, his people, saying that the Jews were boasting when they said, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, and notice they call him son of Mary and not son of God, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them, and those who defer therein are full of doubts, with no knowledge, but only conjecture to follow, for as surely they killed him not. And this is the verse that talks about Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself, and Allah is exalted in power. He's wise, and there is none of the people of the book that must believe in him before his death. And on the day of judgment, he will be a witness against them. Now, isn't that interesting? Satan attacks Jesus even... I mean, he tells the Muslim people... The uh, Jesus is a good prophet. He is from God. He heals the sick and the blind, and he does all kinds of stuff. But he knocks him one little degree off the cross. Just that's all he takes for Muslims to go to hell is to believe that Christ actually didn't die for their sin because. If they don't believe that, then they're going to have to face God with their own sin. Thanks be to Christ and him crucified. So Satan attacks the cross because he knows you attack the cross, you attack every doctrine in our scripture, and he wins. But Christ has conquered him already. Go ahead. Uh, this will be our last question, and then we'll stop at noon for a devotion and prayer, and then we'll have lunch. So uh, go ahead. Oh, by the way, I love your stories, by the way. It's, it's very moving. Uh, Thanks. Um, you, know, I, you know, I understand that every year there's, there's, there's a, move, a Muslim where they kind of centralize into one area. And I, I'm not sure where they go, but they, they kind of come together every year, and they kind of spin around either counterclockwise or clockwise, and look at a stone. What does that stone represent? Can you describe that? I mean, you can do that. 
Are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's called the Kaaba al Al Kaaba is the uh, is the place where uh, I mean, like Adam said, there's so many stories about how the Kaaba was a place where Abraham's descendants through Ishmael re-kept it and reserved it. It's a, a place where, uh, call it the black stone, uh, eventually where God spoke to his people and uh, it, it attracts, I think, about three million people. Three million Americans go to Mecca every year to go tour this place because they think that it was uh, reserved from the time of Abraham. And I think, I believe, uh, a person that who can really help answer this question is uh, Dr. Jim Dredke. You want to answer that question? I know Jim. Here, I'm going to give you that. Uh, this pilgrimage thing, it's a, it's a really big event. But I don't think Kareem, three million from the US, three million all told. Uh, and if you're a Muslim, you are required once in your lifetime to make that pilgrimage. It was interesting when we were in Saudi Arabia, they have put restrictions that if you're a Saudi, you can only go on pilgrimage once every so many years. Otherwise, they'd all take off. A nice vacation to uh, walk around this Kaaba. And if you uh, study what's happening, it's all a reliving of the memory of Abraham. And a lot of Muslims feel that if you die in Mecca, you're immediately translated into heaven. So a lot of these contingents from around the world, they're old people who go. Because, and then they have doctors and nurses accompanying that pilgrimage group because it's going to be a special blessing if you could immediately be translated to heaven. It's interesting uh, what they've been saying about Islam and sin. To a certain extent, Islam seems to overlook sin because it's natural man's inclination. And we sin because God created us capable of sinning. And so it's, it's almost like as if it's, it's denied, and yet at the same time you have this whole elaborate system of work righteousness. Consciences still are at work. And if you and I, in talking with Muslims, can uh, somehow touch that inner core of doubt that's part of that whole system. And something I found extremely interesting is what happens when a person dies. Because you've sort of been denying all along that sin is much of a factor in life. And yet, the relatives who knew that person, their father, their brother, their sister, their mother, they know something about how those people lived, and then there's some doubts. Did they really make it into heaven? And so there's an expression in Arabic that talks about the bridge. Maybe you need to help them make it over the bridge. So it varies from culture to culture, but there are sacrifices that are made. There are certain memorial times, all part of what's become an interesting system of helping people over the bridge. 
Anyway, I just, you know, as I heard uh, Adam and Kareem speak, reminded me of uh, when I first started working among Muslims before a lot of you people were born, 1962. And I said to, we were living in Ghana at the time, and I said to uh, one of our fellow missionaries, we should really be doing work among Muslims, shouldn't we? And he said, uh, well, why? He said, you know, they'll never change. Now, if one of you had said that to me, I could have swallowed it easier than a fellow missionary, because missionaries are change agents, like Kareem was saying. We're sent abroad, or we're commissioned here at home to bring about change in people's life through the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I can remember just really being caught off guard. And I finally mumbled something like, well, didn't Jesus give us the Great Commission that we're to preach the gospel to everyone? And he said, he kind of humped and hawed and said, uh, yeah. But you know they'll never change. <laughs> he had the last word for me. The first time I went to Michigan, I had heard there was an Iranian convert at the University of Michigan. I tracked him down. He thought he was the only Iranian who had converted to Islam. I mean, converted to Christianity. And uh, just recently, in October, my wife and I were at a conference that we actually helped bring into being in 99, when we were living in Fort Wayne, to bring together missionaries working among Muslims in North America. We hoped to get 40 to that first conference. We actually got about 80. And this conference had about 200 actively working across the denominational board. And one of the men who's a real expert on Iranian culture and people, he was a missionary in Iran till uh, all of our people were kidnapped there and held hostage for so long. At that time, they estimated there were 300 evangelical Christians from Iran anywhere in the world. Today, we heard there are more than a million. They are the largest number of people coming out of any Muslim group. It's something to praise and thank the Lord for. The Holy Spirit is at work. Thank you. Let's give uh, Kareem Badawi and Adam Francisco another hand.